Capitol. This is the second time in American history that a president, current or former, has been criminally indicted by the Department of Justice. In both cases, that president is Donald Trump. In June, Trump was indicted in Florida for his alleged mishandling of classified documents after leaving office. Today's indictment is related to efforts by Trump to challenge the results of an election he lost. Up to CBS News has learned that attorneys for President Trump met with federal prosecutors in the special counsel's office last Thursday. Mr. Trump then posted on his social media not long after that meeting. And he wrote, my attorneys had a productive meeting with the DOJ this morning, explaining in detail that I did nothing wrong, was advised by many lawyers, and that an indictment of me would only further destroy our country. CBS News correspondent Scott McFarlane is outside the courthouse where the former president's indictment was just handed up by the grand jury. Scott? It was at first sealed when it was handed up by this grand jury about 30 minutes ago. Now it's been released. It's a 45-page indictment with four felony charges. Let me read them to you, John. Conspiracy to defraud the United States. Conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding. Obstruction of and attempting to obstruct an official proceeding. And conspiracy against rights. If that phrase, obstruction of an official proceeding, sounds familiar to you, it's because more than 300 of the January 6th riot defendants have faced that charge the official proceeding being the January 6th electoral count. These are felony charges. Now the second federal criminal case against former President Trump just released here in federal court in Washington. This is where the case will exist in Washington, D.C. And based upon the nomenclature of the case number, John, I can tell you this case appears to be assigned to Judge Tanya Chudkin, a 2014 Obama administration appointee who has been noticeably and particularly critical of what happened at the Capitol January 6th and has had some criticisms for the former president when she handles the sentencings of many of the January 6th defendants who've come through her court. So it's four charges that do align, John, with what we had from the target letter Donald Trump acknowledged receiving, receiving on July 15th. It's that language that indicated obstruction of an official proceeding and conspiracy against rights. We're going to read through the 45 pages of this indictment just released as handed up by a grand jury and its foreperson at 515 Eastern Time today, August 1st, 2023. Scott, we're looking right now at the front page of the indictment. Um, and would you go through for us uh, those four counts again, for those of us who are not as well versed in this as you are, and as you say, this tracks essentially what the expectation was. But go through those four counts again, if you would. Three of them have the phrase conspiracy in them, which is somewhat common in a federal case and certainly begs the question, are there more defendants to come? Would it take more than one person to execute a conspiracy? It's conspiracy to defraud the United States, conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding. Again, as a very common charge from the Justice Department in January, six cases overall. Obstruction of an attempt to obstruct an official proceeding, again, that official proceeding being the January 6th electoral count, which was very much obstructed for several hours that day. And conspiracy against rights, which is a broader term for a charge that goes against people who have power, positions of authority. In some cases, it's police officers facing that charge, or even judges in the past have faced that charge. In this case, it'd be a former president of the United States. There's a lot of granular detail in this indictment we're going to pick up on. But those four broad-based counts don't come as a surprise, John, based on what was in the target letter Donald Trump received. There were certain statutes quoted in that target letter that indicated these very charges. But this is an initial indictment of Donald Trump his first federal case is in the Southern District of Florida. His second federal case right here in the nation's capital in Washington. And Scott, give us a, a sense very quickly, if you would, of the um, drama, if there was any, of this proceeding, or was it otherwise kind of business of you, as usual in the federal courthouse? This happened in what I would characterize as a garden variety way. The magistrate judge on duty, Mokshila Opadiai, was handling grand jury returns today. And about 5 p.m. Eastern time, two different prosecutors came in. A Department of Justice prosecutor to hand up from a grand jury two different charges on two unrelated cases. And then an attorney who's been associated with special counsel Jack Smith's case came in and announced the handing up of one 
indictment. The grand jury foreperson in the case was there in the room. They didn't give the initials or the name of the defendant in that case, as is often the case when grand jury indictments are returned. They said they wanted that case sealed. Well, it is now suddenly available and unsealed to the public. A four count felony count indictment of the former president. And what just one note logistically here, when you have a federal felony case, a felony case, it has to come from a grand jury. A prosecutor doesn't do that unilaterally. It comes through the grand jury system, which is why we've been on high alert throughout this day because the grand jury was seen here early this morning, departed here mid-afternoon, but the grand jury foreperson wasn't seen leaving. So we were expecting some movement in court that had happened after court closing hours at about 515 Eastern. All right, Scott McFarland, thank you so much for the, with the latest reporting. Robert Costa, your thoughts on these four charges? This is a stunning moment in American history. A former president of the United States has been accused of trying to defraud the United States. And this was, in the words of the special counsel in this indictment, a sprawling conspiracy to overturn a presidential election, not with Trump as some kind of accomplished, but as the person really spearheading the entire operation inside the Oval Office, pulling every lever of power, trying to pressure his vice president to overturn the election. We know former Vice President Mike Pence has been a key witness in this January 6th investigation. Conspiracy to work with someone like John Eastman, the outside conservative lawyer who authored what's called a blueprint for a coup, a two-page document saying that Trump could argue that there was falsely argue that there was voter fraud and thus the election needed to be sent back to the states. And why the term defraud the United States? Because the special counsel, based on our reporting, has been interviewing witness after witness saying, did Trump knowingly say he believed the election was rigged, even though he didn't have any evidence to back it up, but he, did he keep pushing this false claim? And they believe they have enough evidence, based on all of these witness interviews, that they can now say Trump went forward with these false claims constantly in front of the American people, knowing that they were not backed up by facts. Even if Rudy Giuliani was waving affidavits in the air, they didn't have credibility. This is an aggressive move by special counsel Jack Smith, not to paint Trump as someone who was called into some decision by outside lawyers, but Trump as the mastermind of an operation to overturn an election and take American democracy to the brink. Major Karen. So the indictment says the former president of the United States spread lies, that he knew that they were lies, and the things that he was saying, not only he had reason to know, but actually knew were false. And to pick up on Bob's point, that makes the former president the central actor mm -hmm. in the greatest crisis played out on live television about the peaceful transition of power in our country's history. And the indictment holds him to account. And it's also reflective, we should po point out, of criminal referrals made by the January 6th committee. The first two referrals it made were obstruction of an official proceeding mm -hmm. and number two, conspiracy to defraud the United States. Those were the first two of the recommendations that came from the House Select Committee on January 6th and they are reflected in this indictment. And the former president has said, well, I got lots of advice from lawyers. You're the president of the United States. You are the singular person who either can set this in motion or stop it. This indictment and the available record, public and otherwise, indicate and confirm he was the central actor, he set it in motion, and now the law and the facts will try to hold him accountable. Jeff Begay's Jack Smith will speak at 6 o'clock this evening, we're being told. Uh, what do you make of this indictment? Uh, well, let me first talk about what we're expecting from uh, Jack Smith, if, if you don't mind. Obviously, we're not expecting a lot. You've seen him before. He doesn't say a lot, barely smiles. That picture is pretty accurate there. But if you look at this indictment, this is built on the backs of the 1,060 people who've been arrested, charged, convicted so far in the thir nearly 31 months since January 6th. There were a lot of people early on who thought, oh, there's no way they're going to charge a former president. Well, of course, if they believe he was, is the ringleader. And that's what you see in this indictment. There's a lot of work that has been going into this, not only by the special counsel's office, but also uh, the U.S. attorney here in D.C. who has prosecuted all these people who followed the orders of presidents, the president, the former president's supporters, as well as the president himself, come to Washington, D.C. They did. Some of them came armed. And, of course, we saw what happened, and a 1,000 of those people, and there are going to be more, mm. 
you know, that investigation hasn't ended. This one hasn't really ended either. There's more to come. Uh, but you There's have... some uh, breaking news. Trump, the campaign has responded. This whole indictment now, these series of indictments come in the middle of a presidential campaign. Trump's the Republican frontrunner in the 2024 race, and he is calling this through his campaign tonight in his statement, election interference. And he's saying the Department of Justice is weaponized. And let me just read you one sentence from the statement from the Trump campaign to, to understand how the stakes are being laid out by Trump and his allies. The lawlessness of these persecutions of President Trump and his supporters is reminiscent of Nazi Germany in the 1930s the former Soviet Union, and other authoritarian dictatorial regimes. So this is not just a response to a legal proceeding. This is a politically charged and historically dramatic moment with real gravity for what this country can endure in terms of American democracy when something's being compared by the Republican frontrunner mm -hmm. to something that occurred in Nazi Germany, all while the investigation, as Jeff said, continues apace. Uh, the former president has cornered the political market on florid language, especially when he's in duress. But that doesn't make it legitimate and it doesn't make it true. To call something election interference when you are being held to the legal account of this country for interfering in the peaceful transfer of power is not only ironic, it is a form of psychological projection. The former president of the United States clearly, if you read this indictment, and available to everyone who watched live television on January 6, 2021, set in motion an effort to slow down, if not interfere or block, a congressional proceeding to certify that presidential election. That happened to hold him and anyone associated with him to account legally for all time in our nation's history is not the act of an authoritarian regime. Scott McFarland has the latest on when former President Trump will show up. Scott? Our latest reporting, John, is that Donald Trump will make an appearance here at the federal courthouse in Washington, 4 p.m. Eastern time on Thursday. In short order, 48 hours after he's charged, he'll make his appearance here in Washington, D.C. This courthouse is massive. It's like the size of a small college basketball arena. Six floors, dozens of courtrooms, many judges. His appearance will be before the same magistrate judge to whom this indictment was handed up today, Judge Mokshila Obadiah. She's the magistrate judge who handles initial appearances. In some cases, she handles arraignments. That's where Donald Trump will appear. If it's in her courtroom, it's the second floor, courtroom five of this federal courthouse. But any number of security protocols will likely go into place, just like they did in Manhattan when the former president appeared there for court, just like they did in Miami when the former president appeared there for court. There are three entrances to this courthouse. It's a giant, and likely some of the areas here will be closed off for what is typically in the federal system a short initial appearance measured in minutes not a lengthy procedure but nevertheless an historic procedure with donald trump appearing here in two days scott mcfarland thank you bob quickly so as we read over this indictment of, of trump it's very important to note as our colleague graham cates has noted in his reporting that there are multiple co-conspirators listed on pages three and four of the indictment, and it's suggestive of people who are working with Trump, an attorney who willingly spread knowingly false claims to pursue strategies related to Vice President Pence's ceremonial role overseeing the certification, a political consultant who helped implement a plan to submit f false fraudulent slates. So what you see from this document, and if you carefully read it, page three and four and other pages here, is that this was an operation alleged by the special counsel to have taken place on multiple fronts. Mm -hmm. Trump pushing people in the states, in the state legislatures at the Republican state level to try to send back alternative slates and to have activists act as so-called fake electors. At the same time, he wanted members of Congress to overturn the election on January 6, 2021. At the same time, he wanted the Justice Department to give it him the, their imprimatur and to say that the election was in some way corrupted by, by election uh, false false uh, election action by people on the ground. And he wanted the vice president to be involved. So you really see the special counsel detailing everything and calling it a co-conspirator at work. Six was, unindicted co-conspirators in the indictment. Whose names we don't know yet. We do not know yet. Um, let's bring in Ricky Kleeman, CBS News legal analyst. Ricky, the, the special prosecutor says that the president, former president, Shortly after the election of November 3rd, 2020, the defendant launched his criminal scheme. I'd like your take on what that means, but one more uh, item from the indictment. It states that Trump widely disseminated his false claims of election fraud for months, despite the fact 
that he knew and in many cases was informed directly that they were not true. What's your thought about a criminal scheme and what you've been able to tell so far from this indictment? Well, of a 145-page indictment, John, we're looking at, excuse me, out of a 45-page indictment, we're looking at 130 paragraphs, which detail facts that create the elements of criminal offenses. There may be a political overlay here, and we can talk about the political overlay at another time, but right now, what we have in front of us is something that is a document that charges a person with criminal offenses that create prison time, and it is the result of a painstaking investigation. When we hear the word conspiracy, what also ought to come to mind is the timing. We are now on August 1st. We have a case that is supposed to come to indictment, um, because the prosecutor has said so, in Georgia. And Fonnie Willis, that prosecutor, has talked about the possibility of looking at a criminal scheme, same words, but as a RICO conspiracy, a racketeering influence, organized, corrupt conspiracy. One of the reasons that I believe Jack Smith finished up and got this out now was he needs his indictment to be first so that any indictment in Georgia does not try to supersede or contradict the Department of Justice indictment. And what's important to me here, John, is who are the victims? Not only all those Congress people and the people who were working in Congress on January 6th during that terrible day, but also it's the voters. It's the civil rights violation whose rights were abrogated. It's the voters in the sense that their votes were going to try to be taken away by a scheme that had gone on for months to say that those votes in those seven states should be flipped. And that's what stands out to me. Ricky Kleeman, thank you very much. Uh, with us now is Scott Fredrickson, a former federal prosecutor. Scott, um, pick up wherever you would like, but also would you address this notion that uh, the former president mentioned in one of his social media posts, he said he was told by lawyers, um, Bob Costa has been reporting that may be one of the prongs of his defense, which is, I was just following the wise legal counsel of those around me. Major also addressed this. How uh, much of a shield is that in this case? Well, I think the indictment meets that head on. Five of the unindicted co-conspirators are attorneys, his own attorneys, except for one who was a Justice Department attorney. Uh, there is a advice of counsel defense, but uh, you don't have an advice of counsel defense when your own attorneys are your co-conspirators. Um, and um, if you assert an advice of counsel, you waive that privilege, and that means the prosecutors get to look at all those communications. Uh, an attorney cannot advise you to commit a crime, and you can't rely on that as a defense. So uh, early on in the indictment, uh, Special Counsel Smith lists six unindicted co-conspirators, five conspirators, five of those are attorneys, four of those are Trump's own attorneys. So. Uh, you know, he's entitled to a fair trial, but uh, frankly, that kind of blasts any idea of advice of counsel right out of the water. Right, Scott Fredrickson, now, thank you. Oh, go ahead. There's a couple other things that I, I think we should know. In the right out of the box, the uh, special counsel makes clear that his case is based on the premise that this was a president who was determined to stay in power and to do it by spreading lies about the false election uh, uh, lies about the, the the lies about it being stolen. The other thing that uh, we were waiting to see is whether, as part of the conspiracy, the special counsel would bring in the January 6 uh, ride and insurrection, and he did. Part of the manner and means of the conspiracy, as alleged in the indictment, is that. When it became apparent the vice president, Vice President Pence, would not agree uh, to stop his uh, electoral college counting, which confirmed the election of President Biden, uh, the former president encouraged a violent crowd 
to uh, go to the Capitol, and they attempted to exploit that. So we didn't know if that was coming as well. The rest of it is incendiary, but as expected, use of false state electors, uh, false certificates, the uh, uh, rendition of all the facts showing the president was told over and over again by a variety of people that uh, his lie about the election being stolen was in fact false and was a lie, and he knew it. So all of that's laid out in this indictment uh, in fairly clear form. Scott Fredrickson, former federal prosecutor, thank you so much. We now have Democratic Congressman and former January 6th committee member uh, Jamie Raskin joins us now. Congressman, uh, this was obviously something, a recommendation was made by the January 6th committee. How does this indictment square with what the committee wanted and how much further does it go? Well, it's parallel to what um, we suggested, and I think it's a very um, elegant sequencing of what took place because there was a conspiracy to interfere with the federal proceeding, the joint session of Congress to receive and count the electoral votes. There was a conspiracy to defraud the American people uh, by assembling all of these counterfeit electors and then presenting them as a justification for setting aside the lawful constitutional proceeding and moving in a different direction just to name Donald Trump essentially the new president. And then all of it was galvanized for the purpose of conspiring to substitute this phony result for the actual voting rights of the people. And um, that count to me is an echo of what Abraham Lincoln said about insurrection back at the beginning of the Civil War, where he said that violent insurrection is fundamentally an assault on the rights of the people to choose their own leaders. And that's essentially what this indictment is saying in the form of a criminal prosecution. This was an effort to steal away the actual lawful election result and the voting rights of the people by substituting a completely counterfeit and fraudulent process. Congressman, you uh, and the committee were unable to speak to some people uh, within the Trump inner circle, uh, former chief of staff Meadows, Rudy Giuliani, the vice president, Mike Pence. I don't know if you, you have had a chance to read through all of this, but if you, even if you haven't, what would you be looking for to see whether the special counsel's investigative skills built upon the case that you laid out in those hearings uh, or have you seen anything in what you've been able to read that suggests uh, that he was able to make the case uh, more thoroughly in some of these areas that you all were investigating on the committee? Well, I've only been able to give it a, a cursory read, but um, it's quite parallel to what the committee found. Of course, we included uh, one statutory charge that appears to be omitted here, uh, which is... Um, uh, aiding and abetting and giving comfort to an insurrection. And, uh, of course, we don't know why either the grand jury decided not to vote a charge there or um, the Jack Smith decided not to bring that charge before the grand jury. It is a statute that has not been used very much, and it's uh, one that has not been constitutionally tested in the Supreme Court. So maybe they decided there is such a super abundance of other criminal violations that are evident that there was no reason to to go to that one. But otherwise, they found uh, pretty much as we found, this was an attempt to overthrow the election result, to usurp the voting rights of the people, to interfere with a federal proceeding, and to establish a counterfeit electoral process to supplant the actual one that exists under the Constitution and under federal and state law. So I feel very pleased that this is such a vindication of the rule of law in America and that um, this grand jury saw what the January 6th committee saw when we tried to analyze the chaos and the violence that had been unleashed uh, against America, not just on January 6th, but in the weeks leading up to it. All right, Congressman Jamie Raskin, thank you so much for being with us. We are waiting for the special counsel to go to those microphones you're looking at. He's scheduled for 6 o'clock, and we'll go to him the minute he utters his first syllable. Until then, congressional correspondent Nicole Killian is outside of the Fulton County Courthouse in Atlanta. Nicole, remind us why you're there, and has there been any reaction down in Atlanta to this indictment? 
Yeah, well, certainly this is on the radar of Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis. In fact, we heard from the Fulton County Sheriff earlier today who spoke to reporters who echoed what we've heard from the district attorney here is that they are ready to go in terms of their own case that they have been pursuing in regards to alleged 2020 election interference. And the sheriff noted uh, that it is even possible that he could send a team to Washington to observe in the event uh, that the the former president is arraigned and makes a court appearance in Washington, D.C. That is something that they did not only in Miami when the former president appeared there, but also in New York to prepare because we are currently in a window where the district attorney at any time could announce a charging decision in her investigation, which has spanned for more than two years. And of course, uh, the centerpiece of that investigation is a phone call that was made to Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger in the days uh, right before January 6th, where the former president pressed Raffensperger saying, you know, find me the 11,760 votes in an attempt or hope uh, to perhaps overturn the election results here in the state of Georgia. We know that the Secretary of State not only appeared uh, before a special purpose grand jury here in Fulton County, but also met with federal prosecutors. And that call is also cited in the indictment that was unsealed today. So while there is some overlap with these cases, of course, uh, they are uh, quite different in nature and scope as well. But we do expect a potential indictment here in Fulton County within a matter of weeks, John. Nicole Killian, congressional correspondent in Fulton County on just one of the uh, portions of what the special counsel has called a criminal scheme by the former president that he alleges was launched just after Election Day on November 3rd, 2020. As far as the current sitting president is concerned, Chief White House correspondent Nancy Cordes is with President Biden. Nancy? John, we're in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, where President Biden is on vacation, keeping a low profile. We have asked the White House for any reaction to this indictment, but we don't expect to get one, frankly. Uh, this White House repeatedly, when asked about indictments, when asked about charges against the former president, when asked anything about these ongoing investigations, uh, tends to say, nothing or as little as possible referring us to the Department of Justice. Uh, everyone at the White House from the president on down has said that they don't want to influence DOJ in any way. But that doesn't mean that President Biden hasn't weighed in on his predecessor's actions, especially when it comes to January 6th. He doesn't talk about it very often, but when he has, he has been scathing, John. On the one-year anniversary of January 6th, he accused former President Trump of rallying the mob to attack. He said he watched it all on TV from the White House dining room near the Oval Office and did nothing for hours as police were assaulted. He accused him of spreading a web of lies, not just on January 6th, but months before the election even took place. And he said that the former president ignored what he was being told by his own attorney general, his own vice president, and governors from every state in the nation about the validity of the 2020 election. Uh, we don't hear much from this president anymore, particularly not as this investigation heated up about his predecessor's actions. He has tried to be uh, very careful, knowing that this is going to be an ongoing issue as we get closer to, uh, you know, his, his repeat matchup, if you will, against former President Trump. Nancy Cordes with President Biden, White House correspondent. Uh, thank you so much, Nancy. Scott McFarlane has some more de details as we wait for the special counsel to walk to the microphones. Uh, Scott, what do you know about the judge? If you go to the last quarter of the indictment, you see references to January 6th. A lot of talk about fake electors, a lot of talk about what was known about the election. But if you get to the bottom quarter, you see references to what the special counsel calls the defendant's exploitation of the violence and the chaos at the Capitol. And one of the references is to then House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy in a conversation Donald Trump had during the riot with Kevin McCarthy, in which there was a reference, according to the special counsel, that you seem more concerned about the election, than, they seem more concerned about the election than you do, Mr. McCarthy. But also, note where this case is headed. It's headed here to Washington, D.C., to federal court, and assigned to Judge Tanya Chutkin, a 24 14 appointee of this court, an Obama administration appointee who will be handling this case after the magistrate judge has her hearing with Donald Trump on Thursday. 
Scott, briefly, and I might have to leave you because the special counsel's do any moment, but what's security like there, and how uh, I imagine when the former president shows up, it's going to be uh, quite severe. A lot of reinforcements here. Uh, the U.S. Marshals are here, U.S. Park Police and D.C. Police all have some type of foothold at this courthouse when there's major events. We expect that to ratchet up exponentially Thursday afternoon for this 4 p.m. Eastern Time court appearance. Scott McFarland, thank you. Uh, quickly, Jeff Pegues, the security, you've covered this now for this is the third one each time significant measures have to be taken yeah and, and you didn't really see that in miami you saw the the uh, court appearance there there were there weren't enough barricades was the concern miami police thought they did a good enough job but in washington dc because of all of the landmarks here because of all the public activity on the streets any given day you're gonna have to set up a lot of barricades you're gonna have to coordinate uh, between federal and local law enforcement. And, of course, on January 6th, there was criticism about how well or how uh, intelligence and law enforcement efforts sort of fell apart leading up to January 6th. And so they, they, they're not going to want a repeat of that. Sure. They're going to make sure that they coordinate with D.C. Ho Homeland Security to prepare. And visually, it will be an echo, in a sense, if the former president supporters arrive, as they did in Miami and as they did in, in Manhattan, uh, it will echo the scenes of that very day. Yeah, but, you, but the crowds have not been no. that big. Yeah. Why? Right. Because a lot of people... People are facing criminal charges yes. for following President Trump's orders and showing up here in Washington. Certainly smaller numbers than the former president had hoped or led people to believe there right. might be on his behalf. One of the things that the indictment makes very clear, and it's an important point in this moment in American history, the indictment makes clear something that is fundamentally true but needs to be stated in a legal document like this. The defendant had a right, like every American, to speak publicly about the election and to even claim falsely that there had been outcome determinative fraud during the election and that he had won. He was also entitled to formally challenge the result of the election. I'm reading from the indictment yeah. directly. It also says, after exhausting all of those legitimate legal means and being shown that he lost, the president then became malicious about holding on to power. Mm -hmm. And the idea that he can speak about this, raise questions, pursue legal avenues, all of that is legitimate. And he did that. But once he lost there, he made a fundamental dis decision, one never before made by any sitting chief executive in the history of this country, right. to take other means to hold on to power. And that is the central question in this indictment and will be the central question before the jury. There are rules for fighting these things out. He didn't play by them. No. And we build on what Major just said. It's such an important point. December 30th, 2020, Donald Trump has a conversation, then president with Steve Bannon. Pence is on vacation as vice president. He says, get Pence home. Pence is now the target. Because as Major said, everything had failed for Trump and Giuliani in the courts. They were struggling to have any kind of strategy moving ahead. The electors had already voted in mid-December of 2020. December 30th, a turning point. Focus on Pence. That's what Bannon and other outside advisors tell Trump. And on January 3rd, Pence goes to the Senate parliamentarian. And she tells him, sir, you have nothing to do with on January 6th, except count the votes. He says, well, that's what my lawyers have been telling me. That's what I'm going to do. The next day, January 4th, 2021, John Eastman, the conservative lawyer who authors this blueprint for a coup in the Oval with Pence. And Trump confronts Pence face to face in front of Eastman and other lawyers. And he says to Pence, listen to John almost threatening, based on our reporting. Listen to John. Follow the Eastman plan. Pence says, I'll still think about it. Let me take my time, but I can't do it, Mr. President. The next day, Trump calls in on January 5th, Pence into the Oval Office for the ultimate one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. with Trump. Trump is so into the moment, and this has been confirmed by testimony in front of the January 6th committee, he opens the door to the Oval Office so he can hear the gathering mob outside on Freedom Plaza, a freezing cold night. Some of the aides to Trump walk in the Oval Office and they say to themselves, why is the door open? Gusts of air are coming in the room. But Trump wants to hear the mob outside. And he says to Pence, infamously, based on our reporting, you have to do this for me, Mike. You have to do this for me. Walk away from the certification on January 6th. Because what was the hope? That the certification would be delayed. And if it was delayed, then the conspiracy would be effective in Trump's eyes. Because the states, where at least Republicans controlled the legislatures, could send new electoral slates.
And Major, this is not just a question about the past. What you were talking about is there is a, there is a system for adjudicating disputes mm -hmm. in America, and the president did not play by that system. Mm -hmm. And we're coming up with another election, and there are many people who thought it wasn't that he played outside the rules, it was that he didn't play hard enough outside the rules. Well, there, are, there might be some who believe that. He, he could have played harder. I don't know quite how he could have played any harder. As Bob has articulated, he tried to use the Justice Department. He tried to use the Department of Homeland Security. He tried to use his political apparatus. He tried to convince state legislatures. I mean, all, just about every lever he could think of to pull, he tried to pull. And we have an established record on this. These are not disputable facts. They aren't. And the testimony that makes them indisputable facts comes from not Democrats who hate former President Trump, not think tank people who are not aligned with the Republican Party, Republican Party stalwarts, Trump administration stalwarts, people handpicked by the former president. They are the central and most important witnesses mm -hmm. in this case, and they will be as this case unfolds. We've had close elections in our history, John. You know this as well as I do. 1800, 1824, 1876, 1960, 2000, and every single one of those close elections in which the fate of the country was in the balance for those who were most aggressively competing for that power. All of them had a central choice to make. Do I try to under, undermine this system? Or do I live within its guardrails? Every single previous president lived within those guardrails until this one. And one thing we have not mentioned, as a result of January 6th, five police officers died. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about those pictures. I will never forget the picture of the guy beating on the officer with an American flagpole. To me, that said it all. This was a mob attacking these police officers, and too often, I think, and I'm sure the families of the officers feel the same way, they get lost in all this, but that was a violent day. Bob, uh, Greg Jacob, lawyer for the vice president, as I recall, told, there's this question whether the president was just listening to his lawyers. There was some testimony in the January 6th hearings, as I recall, that from, from Greg Jacob, that, that the president was told by John Eastman that this was not a legal theory, that this this idea of, of fake electors was, uh, well, was not legal, and that that goes to this question. You're basically of what... asking Pence for a small violation of election law. That's right. a direct quote from the January 6th investigation. There he is uh, in that testimony, which suggested that, um, which, which, which undermines this idea that the president That it was, was... foundational, that it was legitimate, that it was the body of uh, understood law in America. It wasn't the body of understood law by any stretch of the imagination. And what you see from John Eastman is someone who comes out of the orbit, uh, who's not part of Trump's inner circle. But at, in the final days of the Trump administration, he's looking for anyone who's going to give him an exit ramp, a path to stay in power. That's why Sidney Powell is in the White House. She's up in the residence of the White House talking with Trump about potentially seizing voting machines. And that's why John Eastman, who was not known by Trump, a lawyer from California, is brought in because he says, well, there might be a way. But you're right, Greg Jacobs the counsel for then Vice President Pence. In that January 4th meeting, Pence says to Eastman, why don't you just go meet with my lawyer, Greg Jacob, and hash it out? And so they have a private meeting in the old executive office building, John Eastman and Greg Jacob. And in that meeting, based on under oath testimony from Greg Jacob before the January 6th committee, Eastman reportedly says, well, I did afloat this theory to Trump, and I have authored this memo, but I'm not really sure it's going to hold water. And Jacob explodes. He's not a he's a mild mannered person, but he explodes in terms of being a lawyer saying, how is this circulating at the highest levels of the federal government? Yet Eastman persisted because even on January 6th, when the Capitol is under siege, Jacob talks about how he's communicating with Eastman via text messages and email and Eastman saying, follow the plan, follow the plan. And, Major, this is something the president, the former president still believes now. All of these things, he hasn't changed his mind on the legality of it and the outcome of the election, as wrong as they both may be. No, he hasn't. As a matter of fact, he's even waded into the possibility of becoming president again and issuing pardons for anyone implicated in this. So that puts in a nutshell his approach to the facts, to the law, and to power. If he reclaims it, he will pardon those who helped put this in motion. Jeff Begays, we've got about a minute, apparently, until Jack Smith shows up. Um, he doesn't say a whole lot when he comes out. 
<laughs> no, he doesn't. As you guys know, I sort of bumped into him on a plane to Miami, and I was I was just watching his his mannerisms just to see if he would crack a smile with his team, maybe drink something. I didn't see anything like that. He seemed focused, even sit all, sitting. I think he was sitting uh, in a middle seat. May have, may have been a window seat but sort of blended in. Most people on the plane, I don't think they knew who he was. And uh, he wasn't trying to draw attention, but we just spotted him. And what do we... Part of history now. Yeah. Um, I Indelibly. Think he's done, I think, 100 uh, triathlons, so I think he has the um, fortitude to make it through a middle seat. What um, do we know about his operation? It's been pretty unleaky, um, just as these kinds of investigations go. Does it have a character to it? Uh, Jack Smith's character. Uh, the, the prosecutors that he has on that team, they are among the best. They are... They are pros. They are major league prosecutors. And you see that because there, there really aren't a lot of leaks coming out of that office. People will say, oh, there's some, there really aren't that many leaks. They, they do their speaking through these court documents. And that's why these court documents are so detailed, because in a lot of ways, they're trying to respond to what the former president puts out on social media. Well, and that raises the question as we watch, perhaps here we have the special counsel entering the room now. And let's pause to listen, listen to Jack Smith as he addresses reporters. Good evening. Today, an indictment was unsealed, charging Donald J. Trump with conspiring to defraud the United States, conspiring to disenfranchise voters, and conspiring and attempting to obstruct an official proceeding. The indictment was issued by a grand jury of citizens and it sets forth the crimes charged in detail. I encourage everyone to read it in full. The attack on our nation's capital on January 6, 2021 was an unprecedented assault on the seat of American democracy. As described in the indictment, it was fueled by lies. Lies by the defendant targeted at obstructing a bedrock function of the U.S. government, the nation's process of collecting, counting, and certifying the results of the presidential election. The men and women of law enforcement who defended the U.S. Capitol on January 6th are heroes. They are patriots and they are the very best of us. They did not just defend a building or the people sheltering in it. They put their lives in the line to defend who we are as a country and as a people. They defended the very institutions and principles that define the United States. Since the attack on our capital, the Department of Justice has remained committed to ensuring accountability for those criminally responsible for what happened that day. This case is brought consistent with that commitment, and our investigation of other individuals continues. In this case, my office will seek a speedy trial so that our evidence can be tested in court and judged by a jury of citizens. In the meantime, I must emphasize that the indictment is only an allegation and that the defendant must be presumed innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt in a court of law. I would like to thank the members of the Federal Bureau of Investigation who are working on this investigation with my office, as well as the many career prosecutors and law enforcement agents from around the country who have worked on previous January 6th investigations. These women and men are public servants of the very highest order, and it is a privilege to work alongside them. Thank you. Why didn't you charge any of the other co-conspirators at this time? And there, there we have uh, Special Prosecutor Jack Smith saying this is an unprecedented act, an attack on the bedrock function of democracy. He was typically laconic. Bob Costa. One thing to note that, he, that the special counsel did not is former Vice President Mike Pence, based on this document, is a central, crucial, key witness in this investigation. This 
indictment says Pence took contemporaneous notes and date after date of Pence's recollection of events is there. We know Pence met for hours with the grand jury, but to have a former vice president who was in the room with right. Trump, often one on one in the Oval Office, and now testifying in detail to the special counsel, he could end up being the most important witness in this case. Because do you think, Bob, it's not just X happened after Y, but he has some ability to speak to what was inside the former president's And he can head. speak to possible criminal intent. Now, Pence has said publicly he does not know, and it's not for him to judge, whether Trump had criminal intent in his actions. But by Pence detailing what Trump said, for example, this indictment says Pence recalled Trump calling him not uh, too honest, too honest, as they had a private conversation about the election. And so Pence is someone who was weaponized at the end of the presidency for Trump. And to have him cooperating with the investigation gives the special counsel an eyewitness account that someone who's not a lawyer or some Trump functionary. And to put this in a political context, let's also remind ourselves that the former vice president is now challenging the former president for the nomination of the Republican Party in 2024. So he is a witness against the former president, as Bob Costa just outlined, and is a political opponent against him. And he is a primary fact witness and a constitutional empowered officer of the executive branch. Mm -hmm. And that makes him the most important, or if not the most important, one of the most important fact witnesses, because he saw this entire progression of the argument through all of the ways that Trump was thwarted through the legal means of challenging the election. Then he went to extra legal means, and he was the recipient of maximum pressure mm -hmm. on that extra, according to the indictment, extrajudicial pressure to overturn the election. But here's, here, oh, go, go ahead. To, here's the thing. You know, a lot of this obviously, allegedly, happened behind closed doors. But what's so frustrating sometimes about the former president is that he'll say things publicly where a prosecutor or even his own attorney would be would be flabbergasted just telling him, please stop, don't keep putting this information out there. So a lot of what is in this happened publicly. We're going to turn now to Scott Fredrickson, a former federal prosecutor. Scott, what's your take after taking a look at this and uh, listening to the special prosecutor in his remarks? Yes, I, I think one thing that strikes anyone who has watched Special Counsel Smith is that he does not show emotion very often. He showed emotion today when he talked about the fact that this indictment is brought consistent with the prosecutions of the individuals responsible for the deaths of five law enforcement officers and the mob, the violent mob that attacked the Capitol. And when he talked about that here at his brief news conference, you could see he was emotional about that. And that is driving him when he said this was an assault on democracy fueled by lies of a president. And just to, to underscore that, Scott, so the point is that while in the political realm this might get discussed um, in all kinds of uh, maybe even abstract ways or in political terms, what, what it sounds like he was doing is saying two bedrock principles, accountability uh, and also that there were real victims here uh, who held the line uh, when somebody else was trying to cross it. Well, I think you're, you're absolutely right. And I think what surprises most of us here is how much of the January 6 events uh, have been made a part of this indictment. Many, many thought that he would uh, avoid that. Um, and the incitement of the violent mob coming up the Capitol. Instead, it's a central part of the indictment, especially when he gets into the detailed rendition of the uh, attempts to change the vice president's mind in almost a Shakespearean mono mono face off, uh, but detailing uh, falsehoods over and over again told by uh, the former President Trump uh, in an attempt to change the vice president's mind. Former federal prosecutor Scott Fredrickson, thank you. Ricky Kleeman, our CBS News legal analyst, is with us now. Uh, Ricky, you've taken a, a longer look at this indictment. Uh, what else have you concluded? We're going to go back to Ricky uh, 
In a second, Bob Costa, you know the players so well in this drama. Sticking with your idea, uh, your point about the president being the central actor here, if Mike Pence is another key person, who else are you looking for um, as a useful witness for some of what we don't know or what the special prosecutor may have come up with in this indictment? So I always remember the night of January 5th, I was outside the Willard Hotel. And while Trump had a hotel for most of the time, he was president of the United States in Washington down on Pennsylvania Avenue. The other Trump hotel on the eve of the insurrection was the historic Willard Hotel. Because inside that hotel on January 5th, Rudy Giuliani, Steve Bannon, and so many of their associates were calling Republicans in Congress. They were pressuring them to do Trump's bidding. They infamously issued a statement saying Pence was in agreement with Trump's position on January 6th, even when he was not causing Pence to erupt along with his aides and say that's false. And so you have the Willard under under the microscope now. Everyone who was inside the Willard plotting with Giuliani and Boris Epstein and all these other associates to try to overturn the election and those outside who were intense getting ready for the rally the next day and to attack the Capitol. And then, of course, across the street at the White House talking to Trump late into the night. All of these people are now in the spotlight based on this indictment of the special counsel. He is not just painting this based on this indictment as something that was a, a bit of a bad idea gone wrong. He is saying that there was criminal intent to deceive the American people, to defraud the United States, and to mount a multi-pronged conspiracy. It's hard to digest that this is being alleged to happen, and it's being done by the Justice Department at the highest levels against the Republican frontrunner. Right. Indeed. And the indictment pays the former president a compliment, indirectly, in the sense that his vocalizing falsehoods about the election had a dramatic, galvanizing, and impassioning effect on much of the country. Reading from page two, to make his knowingly false claims appear legitimate, create an intense national atmosphere of mistrust and anger, and erode public faith in the administration of the election. The indictment says the former president achieved all of that just by the sound of his voice, mm -hmm. conferring upon him one of the things that former President Trump likes to say about himself. He has a movement. He has a voice, and people respond to it. All true, former President Trump, but you use that voice, you use that influence in ways that are now putting you in criminal danger. Knowingly used it to advance a criminal scheme. Ricky Kleeman is apparently back on the line. Ricky, you've taken a further look at this indictment. What do you, what do you come up with? When I look back, John, at my prosecutorial days, what I wanted to know were who are the victims, what did they suffer, and how did they suffer? Well, the major victim here, of course, is democracy. The secondary, or perhaps in tandem victim, are the American people. The third victim are the American voters. All of those go together. But when we look at the individual paragraphs, what we have to remember, in addition to the people in Congress who might have suffered serious bodily harm, uh, injury, and even death, what we have to also look at is Mike Pence as a central victim in this indictment, and that Mike Pence became a person that Donald Trump, according to the indictment, wanted to do his bidding, and that was to change the election result, that Mike was supposed to do the quote-unquote right thing. But when he didn't, at the time that the Capitol is being breached, that Donald Trump's tweet, when he goes and says that Mike Pence didn't have the courage to do what should have been done to protect our country, et cetera, which is in paragraph 111, that that is what spurs on the chance of hang Mike Pence. And if Mike Pence had not been spirited away by his Secret Service, he might not be running for the nomination today. CBS legal analyst Ricky Kleeman, thank you so much, Ricky. Now we want to go to Chief White House correspondent Nancy Cordes, who has a thought. Nancy? 
John, it was notable in that brief statement that we uh, just heard from the special counsel, Jack Smith, uh, one of the things he did say was that he's going to be spe seeking a speedy trial. Uh, that's notable because we know that he's not getting a speedy trial in uh, the case in Florida having to do with former President Trump's uh, handling of classified documents. That is, case is not going to go to trial until at least mid-2024, just a few months before the presidential election. If he were to get a speedy trial in this case, let's say early 2024, then the trial could take place and we could have an outcome well before the 2024 election takes place in November, possibly even before the end of primary season. And that's notable, of course, because President Trump is currently the runaway front runner, uh, according to recent polls. Uh, and, and actually, his lead uh, appears to be growing all the time. Uh, this is something that uh, the Biden campaign is obviously watching very closely because uh, they are anticipating a matchup uh, again against former President Trump. But when we asked the Biden campaign whether they had any reaction to this new indictment, they said, as predicted, no comment. Nancy Cordes, thank you, Nancy. Scott Fredrickson, I want to bring you back in on something that uh, Nancy hinted at. Um, the calendar, but let's forget the political calendar for the second. How does whoever is in charge here operate all these different investigations and indictments and court trials all at the same time? There are three, the president's indicted three times, plus there are several civil cases. How does that all that get coordinated? Well, it's a good question. There's no formula. It's not provided for in any federal rule, let alone any state rule. Um, oftentimes, it's the first case indicted, and they take it in, in, in turn. But I think what's interesting here is that this case, um, is, uh, which will uh, uh, come to uh, the arraignment for the former president on Thursday, this case could actually jump ahead of the Mar-a-Lago uh, documents case for one important reason. There are no classified documents uh, involved in this case. And the classified documents are a serious complexity in the Mar-a-Lago scheduling. It takes a lot of time to work through uh, those issues. There are none of that uh, issues here. So I wouldn't be totally surprised if this judge, uh, the new judge here in Washington, took this case and moved it ahead and moved it into early 2023 um, ahead of the Mar-a-Lago case. Uh, of course, uh, the former president will fight that and want to delay it till after uh, the trial. But I think the judge could also make a point that this is the most important case. This is the one indictment that charges criminal conduct while the president was, in fact, in office as the president, unlike the other cases. So uh, it goes to the heart of kind of the, the most important charges against him. So I could see this case getting moved forward in an earlier time spot. All right, Scott Fredrickson, thank you uh, for that analysis of the calendar. Once again, former President Trump has been indicted by the special counsel on four counts tied to his attempt to overturn the results of the 2020 presidential election. Among the charges include conspiracy to defraud the United States and obstruction of, of an official proceeding. Our uh, coverage will continue on CBS News streaming, your local news, and tonight on the CBS Evening News. This has been a CBS News special report. For all of us here in Washington, I'm John Dickerson. Hello, I'm Weijia Jiang in Washington. A federal grand jury has voted to indict former President Trump in the January 6th investigation. He faces four counts in the indictment, including conspiracy to defraud the United States. The former president has been summoned to the courthouse here in Washington on Thursday. There are at least six co-conspirators that are not named. Special counsel Jack Smith had this to say about the indictment. Good evening. Today, an indictment was unsealed, charging Donald J. Trump with conspiring to defraud the United States, conspiring to disenfranchise voters, and conspiring and attempting to obstruct an official proceeding. The indictment was issued by a grand jury of citizens here 
in the District of Columbia, and it sets forth the crimes charged in detail. I encourage everyone to read it in full. The attack on our nation's capital on January 6, 2021, was an unprecedented assault on the seat of American democracy. As described in the indictment, it was fueled by lies. Lies by the defendant targeted at obstructing a bedrock function of the U.S. government, the nation's process of collecting, counting, and certifying the results of the presidential election. The men and women of law enforcement who defended the U.S. Capitol on January 6th are heroes. They are patriots and they are the very best of us. They did not just defend a building or the people sheltering in it. They put their lives on the line to defend who we are as a country and as a people. They defended the very institutions and principles that define the United States. Since the attack on our capital, the Department of Justice has remained committed to ensuring accountability for those criminally responsible for what happened that day. This case is brought consistent with that commitment, and our investigation of other individuals continues. In this case, my office will seek a speedy trial so that our evidence can be tested in court and judged by a jury of citizens. In the meantime, I must emphasize that the indictment is only an allegation and that the defendant must be presumed innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt in a court of law. I would like to thank the members of the Federal Bureau of Investigation who are working on this investigation with my office, as well as the many career prosecutors and law enforcement agents from around the country who have worked on previous January 6th investigations. These women and men are public servants of the very highest order, and it is a privilege to work alongside them. Thank you. Why didn't you charge any of the other for more on this, Graham Cates and Jessica Levinson join us now. Graham is a CBS News investigative reporter, and Jessica is a CBS News legal contributor. Jessica, I want to start with you. I know that you've probably been leafing through these 45 pages along with the rest of us. Um, what do these counts tell you about the potential evidence uh, that Jack Smith has now collected against Donald Trump? It tells me that it's strong and that there is a lot of it. So what we see here in the four counts is really a methodically laid out indictment that talks about a scheme to defraud the United States, to try and stop the counting of the Electoral College votes, and to try and cheat people essentially out of an honest counting of their vote. I think it's interesting here that the special prosecutor did not decide to go ahead with the insurrection claim because that can be difficult to prove and there can be some First Amendment issues, some First Amendment defenses there. Instead, I think the way the indictment reads is that the special prosecutor absolutely will rely on the idea that the former president tried to incite an insurrection, but that he's in fact charged crimes that relate to doing that in order to, again, try and invalidate the election, which defrauds the U.S. of their honest vote, excuse me, defrauds the voters of their honest votes, and defrauds the government of their ability to count the votes and their ability to have a free and fair election. In my mind, there's really kind of two parts to the indictment. First, it's that the allegations that the former president lied and that he knew he lied, and then the allegations that the former president took very specific actions to try and overturn the election. And Graham, this indictment also lays out um, the, the special prosecutor's belief that Trump did not act alone. We know that there are at least six other co-conspirators, allegedly, but they have yet to be charged. Do we know why not? Do we know who they might be and how they might play a role in Trump's case? We don't know why they're not charged, but they're described, they're described as four lawyers for former President Trump, a political consultant and a uh, DOJ, Justice Department official. Uh, and they described this series of events where these uh, alleged co-conspirators 
uh, get together to uh, push officials to ignore the popular vote and organize fraudulent slates of electors in seven states, Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, New Mexico, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. So you get kind of the scope of this. And, and uh, the indictment lays out meeting by meeting where they talked about ways to get the slates of electors in there, talked about meetings they had with officials in different states, talking, um, in one case, say, uh, a, an unindicted co-conspirator says, we don't necessarily have the evidence yet, but we have a lot of theories that we're working on. And, uh, and this kind of goes on for two months leading up to January 6th. And Jessica, you know, one thing that really stood out to me in Jack Smith's um, remarks was something that both of you touched on. He said he wanted a speedy trial. Clearly, that means he believes he has the evidence, right? to do that. What, what does a speedy trial mean, though? How fast are we talking? Well, I would say you don't bring this case unless you think you have the evidence. I mean, this is going to be the most scrutinized case potentially in our nation's history. And so a speedy trial really can mean that we're not talking about weeks here, but we could potentially be talking about months. And I know there was a previous conversation about the fact that this case, although it's complicated, it actually could be brought much more quickly than the Mar-a-Lago case, because the Mar-a-Lago case deals with those classified documents. And in that case, we have a relatively new judge who's going to have to figure out a number of really complicated issues dealing with who sees that national security information, whether or not it's presented to the jury. There's a lot of big, thorny questions before you get to trial in the Mar-a-Lago case. And while this case is hugely consequential, I think you could potentially see a very motivated prosecutor and judge say, we're going to do this before the election. I mean, that is absolutely physically possible to do. And of course, I think we know that the former president's best defense is really the electoral calendar. It's not something that would be said in court. It's trying to remain out of court until the election. Regardless of the timeline, it will be unfolding as campaign 2024 really heats up. Graham Cates and Jessica Levinson, thank you for your time. We are following the latest updates on Donald Trump's indictment over his role in the January 6th Capitol riots. Your streaming America Decides. If it's important to our nation. I wonder how you think about where America is at this moment. It's on Face the Nation. Can there be stability if Vladimir Putin remains in power? Face the Nation with Margaret Brennan on CBS. America Decides, taking you inside American democracy. The most important stories on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. You're going to hear a lot of reporting. It is clearly a pivotal moment. Gun control, the economy, education. Both sides of the political aisle fight it out for power. Bringing you the analysis that you need. Thoughtfully, with context. Be part of the conversation. On CBS News Streaming. Welcome to America Decides. An original documentary from CBS reports. I always tell people that Twitter would not be Twitter without black Twitter. It's just us being in fellowship with each other. And it becomes a conversation you don't want to be left out of. People really started to recognize the power of activism on Twitter. Based on that one tweet, the hashtag Oscar so white was trending around the world. If anything has really powered black Twitter, it's been humor. If your food ain't right, Oh, we're going to tell you about that, too. So we tend to create change, create culture and cool. That's how movements happen on Black Twitter and go beyond more than that. Black Twitter, the Twitterverse that changed a generation. Now streaming on the free CBS News app. When weather turns extreme. The threat of severe weather and dangerous tornadoes is expected to last. CBS News and the Weather Channel bring you virtual weather technology. So advanced, so real. Let's bring in our partners at the Weather Channel. Now six feet of water, imagine that. Cars that can act like battery lamps. These hyper-realistic simulations show you what the weather will look and feel like before it happens. Feel the forecast. Streaming on CBS News. An original documentary from CBS Reports. The carnage in our nation's schools has become painfully repetitive. Not one more child! 
School shootings have parents fighting mad. I promised my daughter I was going to fight. This is going to keep on happening. And teachers taking lessons in how to fight back. This is an exercise. We approach it as it's you or them. It shouldn't have to be your teacher's job to protect your life. But will the battle over gun control... People are afraid that they're going to lose their gun rights altogether. ...be the hardest lesson of all. The exercise, you're having to shoot at an adult. Are you prepared to have to kill one of your students? Mm. Guns in the Classroom, now streaming on the free CBS News app. She's the most successful alpine skier, male or female, ever, and a worldwide inspiration. We need a lot of women doing sports really, really well. The story of Michaela Schifrin's game-changing reign at the top of the slopes when we go person to person. Welcome back. As we've been reporting, President Donald Trump has been indicted for his role in the January 6th Capitol insurrection. Hugo Lowe joins us now. He is a political investigations reporter for The Guardian and very sourced up in the Trump world. Hugo, it is great to see you. Um, so obviously, we are already getting emails from the Trump campaign. We're getting statements from the former president. He's already fundraising off of this indictment. Have you spoken to any of your sources about what they think of this? You know, we've been checking in with people in Trump world uh, in the hours leading up to this indictment, I think. Uh, a lot of people in Trump's orbit expected it to come last week, and then when it didn't, they had to all kind of rile themselves back up again to turn on the outrage machine uh, it, so that they could prepare their kind of statements and their kind of media to go out. Um, but I think a lot of the feeling is is split down two ways. One is this kind of resignation that Trump was going to be indicted, regardless of what the lawyer said, regardless of the arguments they made. Um, and kind of the problem and the embarrassment of having another federal indictment. And then there's the other channel where the Trump advisors think, you know, this is just another indictment. We've already had two before. And the fact that, you know, Trump's poll numbers haven't gone down since, uh, since he's been indicted in the other cases probably bodes well for them, at least going into uh, the Republican convention. Right. The former president himself has said that he embraces these indictments um, and he certainly uses that as a talking point in his campaign. So how do you think that he might try to use this to his benefit, not only in terms of support with voters, but to raise more money? You know, I think the fundraising is, is definitely going to be the key thing here. Uh, I think even the Trump advisors are aware that there is kind of a Trump fatigue that has started to set in among his MAGA base. And they were certainly projecting that the amount of money they could raise post this indictment would be less than the money that they've been able to raise, uh, for instance, after the New York uh, AG case, which was the first indictment. And so it was kind of novel and very interesting and kind of sparked a lot of outrage among their supporters. And then also with the documents case, because that, again, was so kind of uh, uh, jarring for a lot of his supporters. They think this one and potentially the Fulton County uh, indictment that might come in the weeks ahead, it might not have the same sort of bite. And so they're bracing for a fundraising boost, but maybe not quite as large as what they've had previously. Um, Hugo, I'm glad you brought up the Fulton County potential indictment there. What is What seems like might happen in the coming days or weeks um, with regard to that case? It's going to come very fast. You know, we've been tracking that case very closely, and our sources in the Fulton County DA's office suggest that when they are done uh, issuing summons to witnesses, uh, it will take about a couple of days to present their case to the regular grand jury. Once that grand jury returns an indictment, then uh, basically it's going to be all about Trump. You know, we expect Trump to be indicted. We expect other co-conspirators to be indicted in that case. Uh, and we've previously reported that some of the charges include uh, criminal solicitation to commit election fraud and possibly a racketeering charge to go with it. And when that happens, you'll see through the month of August, uh, the indictment and then the arraignment, again, of the former president. And Hugo, I have to let you go quickly, but I want to ask you one more thing, which is, is there any concern at all that Trump could face prison time? I don't think so. And But that's basically because I think a lot of the Trump advisors have convinced themselves that Trump is going to win and that once he wins, that he can tell the Department of Justice to drop all the federal cases and, you know, he can work out a deal with the with the state cases. But that's a big assumption. And if he doesn't win, then I think the prospect of prison time is very, very real for him. 
Okay, Hugo Lowe, thank you so much. And now we have Finn Gomez. He is CBS News' political director. Finn, this is another indictment. Um, this is unprecedented. But I wonder whether voters who will decide who the Republican nominee is going to be, whether they think that this is a big deal. Uh, you know, speaking to voters in Iowa last weekend uh, and speaking to them sp specifically about this and the, the potential for this outcome to happen, as we, I think many of us believe it would, uh, there wasn't the impact that I think some others may believe they would have. It really is they've rallied around the president. You've seen that now, how the even his own rivals, Ron DeSantis, just put out a statement essentially rallying around the president, circling the wagons around the former president. His, and his chief rival. And if you look at the polls, the, the polling numbers, we each, they say that uh, it's this is clearly not impacting his trajectory mm -hmm. uh, as he heads towards the nomination. There's still a ton of time left. You know, it, there's a political, just a ton of time in terms of it, it politically uh, before we get to even uh, to the Iowa caucus is the first early voting contest. But I mean, if you look at the New York Times Siena College poll, it's 54 to 17. Uh, Trump to the Santas and everybody else is at three points. You know that just shows where the state of the race is, and that just shows the, the, of, of the impact or lack thereof on Trump. So, from where I sit, you know, I cover the White House, yeah. the White House, the Biden campaign. By design, they are staying absolutely mum about this. They don't want to touch it with a ten-foot pole. But I wonder why the other potential GOP nominees are also staying so, you know, shy about slamming the president for all of these charges he faces. You know, I asked a, um, a senior advisor, advisor to a rival campaign, to Donald Trump's campaign, and they told me that that just isn't worth the risk. Uh, they tested it out themselves. They see that uh, the reaction from the uh, your base voter in these early primary states is that, you know, they are supportive of the president, and they they buy into uh, the argument by uh, the former president and his campaign that this is you know quote a witch hunt that this is a uh, politically motivated and you and you hear that you even hear from 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 Mike Pence uh, um, you know who is who is who's listed in this in this in this indictment uh, you know it's 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 surprising to to some but it, you know again if you if you go and listen to these voters and talk to them directly uh, it just doesn't impact them. Well, I'm glad you brought up Mike Pence, because in this indictment, right. he is all over it. And he seems to be a key witness who took extremely close notes about his interactions with President Trump. But how do you think the fact that he is also running for president against Trump might complicate the indictment as well as his own uh, campaign? It's unprecedented, Weege. I mean, it really is. I mean, he's listed here. He's writing, the, you know, uh, Jack Smith, in, in this report, it talks about his contem contemporaneous notes that he took in these in these discussions with the uh, former president. And at one point when, when he pushed back against uh, uh, then-President Trump uh, about trying to overturn the election, he essentially says, uh, the, the, Trump told Pence, you're too honest. Like, can you imagine that? Like, and if they both end up on the debate stage in a couple weeks, on August 23rd in, in Wisconsin, like, how is that interaction going to be? I mean, this is such an unprecedented place that we are in, a, in modern American political history. And that is a reality that could very much happen. So we will be watching. Yeah. Thank you, Finn. We'll have more on Trump's historic third indictment next. You're streaming America Decides. An original documentary from CBS reports. Controversial Congressman George Santos. Why won't you answer our questions? How did he manage to get elected? Thank you very much. God bless you and God bless the USA. George Santos' campaign was a campaign of deceit, lies, fabrication. And who is he, really? I knew him as Anthony DeVolder from Queens. Really, who he is, he's a fraud. I compare him to the Tinder swindler. From people who know him, the truth, the facts, the lies. He would say that he was worth a hundred million dollars. It's an incredibly cynical episode in American politics, beyond satire. Had you ever seen anything like this? No, and I hope I never see it again. Campaign of Deceit, now streaming on the free CBS News app. She dazzled on the court and off the court as a businesswoman. Thank you for joining us on Person to Person. Tennis superstar and entrepreneur, Serena Williams.
an original CBS Reports documentary. I asked my students, what are we going to do about racism in the United States? The backlash over teaching about racism in American schools. I don't think it has any place in the classroom. We can either pretend and say, no, we're not racist and we're all great people, or we can actually start to do the really, really hard work of addressing it. How did you lose your job? I made the statement that white privilege is a fact. Is it helping diversity and inclusion? When you bring in different people's stories and experience, it enriches education. If you don't talk about something, it doesn't go away. Or driving us further apart. What schools are doing to our children in the name of anti-racism is in fact teaching them racism. The intention is to put us in this war against each other. An original CBS Reports documentary, streaming now. Original CBS Reports documentary. I was entitled to equal pay for equal work under the law. Does the Supreme Court's power need to be checked? Nine Supreme Court justices, five of them said no, she's not entitled. That's not right. Calls to fix the court tend to go along with the politics of the moment. Republican appointed justices have all tended to go in one direction, with the Democratic appointed justices tending to go in another. Even though it's only nine justices, it takes five of them to make the law of the land. Does it have political impact? True. Political intent? Probably not. True. If the American people don't trust the judgments of their court, that's a real problem for our democracy. An original CBS Reports documentary, streaming now. On our places, bright, shiny faces. When you wake up in the morning, we want to be your go-to team. I don't go to work in the morning. I go for coffee with my two good friends, and we talk about the world. What are the words you would use to describe the queen? Kind, caring, and a nice lady. I'm here for you. America needs drivers. And we're here to help. What are you learning from Girls on the Run? Never give up, and to always keep trying. You can see fire and rescue is up. They're doing wellness checks when people are trapped inside their homes. We're going to be OK. We're going to make it. We are following the latest developments in our top story of the evening, the indictment of Donald Trump over his role in the January 6th insurrection. CBS News' senior political analyst, John Dickerson joins us now. John, I know that you've been studying this 45-page indictment all afternoon. Uh, the special counsel did not touch the potential insurrection charges, but he seemed very confident about these four felony counts that really focus on the former president's attempt to overturn a legitimate election. The picture that the special counsel paints of the former president is someone who on on the election basically engages in what the special counsel calls a criminal scheme and directs that scheme in a number of different avenues, keeps trying each one, uh, and then when they fail, he goes on to the next one. Um, and so he makes inroads at the Justice Department. He makes inroads in the individual states. He pressures his vice president, Mike Pence. And then, of course, he supports, as a part of pressuring the vice president, he supports this idea of uh, fake electors or alternative electors, as the president would have called them, all the while knowing that the claims underlying his scheme were lies, and he knew them to be lies. Uh, and yet, nevertheless, he pursued all of these avenues. And then, of course, including calling his supporters to Washington to stop the steal. And I'm glad you brought up the former vice president because he is all over this indictment and appears to be such a key witness. But he is also running for president against Donald Trump in the 2024 presidential election. How do you think that will complicate, um, you know, this case moving forward as well as Pence's campaign? Well, let's it would be more complicated in terms of the case if former Vice President Pence was doing better in the campaign. In other words, if he were doing better, uh, perhaps President Trump, former President Trump could write off any testimony by him as something to try and get Trump out of the race. But Mike Pence is not doing very well in the Republican race. He may not even make the debate stage, which requires a certain level of success within his party. Part of that reason is because his former boss has painted him as a turncoat, mm -hmm. completely upending the normal way in which Republicans used to talk about honor in a presidential race. They used to say, who can stand up and do the right thing at the tough moment? That defines what Mike Pence did, and it's, he's paying the penalty for it politically. 
Um, and I also wonder about, um, you know, just actually, John, we're out of time. Oh, and I'm you will take that, it from Weezer. here. So thank you very much, John. Sure thing. <laughs> That does it for today. You can stream America Decides Monday to Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern. You can watch Primetime with John Dickerson at 7 p.m. Eastern and Pacific. You're streaming CBS News. It's a history-making meeting. Four extraordinary women who are all four-star generals and admirals. How did you deal with being discriminated against? I just worked harder. The future of an ever-evolving U.S. military when we go person to person. Stories start with the who, what, when, and where. CBS News has been following this story. Camilla, you know, why is the government relying on these devices to track migrants? But it's why it's important to you that matters most. Doctor, why are federal health advisors focusing on this specific pill for contraception? And knowing what to ask is how you open the door to a deeper understanding. I'm John Dickerson. See you on Primetime. Streaming free everywhere. Stories that inform. Or you can be really old at 60, and you can be really young at 85. Inspire. How do we unlock the power within ourselves to be who we want to be? And brighten your day. The best part of fame is making people feel good. Always send the people home happy. Make every day a little more like Sunday morning. Here comes the sun. Stream now on the free CBS News app. An original documentary from CBS Reports. He started out as a fun-loving party boy, but the alcohol got the better of him. What I envisioned was him being in some sort of medical facility. I just thought, what a great candidate for them to learn about the results of alcoholism and what it does to a body. But his body was sold to the military, specifically used as a crash test dummy in the simulated Humvee explosion. I was devastated. I had the box. I don't know if they were his ashes or not. I just held it as tight as I could, and I just told him how sorry I was. Body Brokers, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Hey there, welcome to the Uplift. I look over at him, and he's smiling. I'm going to remember that the rest of my life. It's really a miracle that he's with us today. The Uplift, stream now on the free CBS News app. America Decides, taking you inside American democracy. The most important stories on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. You're going to hear a lot of reporting. It is clearly a pivotal moment. Gun control, the economy, education, both sides of the political aisle fight it out for power. Bring you the analysis that you need. Thoughtfully, with context. Be part of the conversation. On CBS News Streaming. Welcome to America Decides, Monday through Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern. After nearly four decades of March Madness, this sports broadcasting legend is stepping away from his role in covering the NCAA basketball tournament. Jim Nance on his fondest memories and what's next when we go person to person. CBS News. Face the nation with Margaret Brennan Sunday on CBS. Since childhood, she never stopped reaching for the skies. Now she spent more time in space than any other American. I might be in a part of something bigger than me. Peggy Whitson's extraordinary career as a history-making astronaut when we go person. Hello, everyone. I'm John Dickerson reporting from our nation's capital with breaking news. For the third time in our history, a former president of the United States, Donald Trump, has been indicted. This time, the indictment has to do with his attack on the electoral system he hopes will make him president again. Tuesday, Trump was handed the indictment from a federal grand jury in an investigation led by the Justice Department's special counsel, Jack Smith, into the assault on the Capitol on January 6, 2021. It accuses former President Trump, the current GOP frontrunner for president, of trying to overturn the results of the last presidential election. It charges him with four counts, including conspiracy and obstruction. CBS News chief election and campaign correspondent Robert Costa has the latest for us. 
According to the indictment, for more than two months following election day, the defendant spread lies that there was fraud in the election and he had actually won. These claims were false and the defendant knew they were false. The attack on our nation's capital on January 6th, 2021, was an unprecedented assault on the seat of American democracy. As described in the indictment, it was fueled by lies. Lies by the defendant. Sources tell CBS News former President Trump's legal team is now mapping out a new strategy to push back on the charges, shifting blame onto lawyers who were advising him at the time of the aftermath of the 2020 election. In a recent social media post, Trump noted his attorneys met with the Department of Justice, saying they explained in detail that I did nothing wrong and was advised by many lawyers. Sources say the strategy could involve trying to pin blame on John Eastman, Trump's former lawyer, who sought to have former Vice President Mike Pence refuse to certify the 2020 election results and presented Trump with a memo outlining a plan to do so. Trump has privately told allies that he believed John Eastman's plan came from a conservative lawyer and that following Eastman's counsel does not mean he conspired against the United States. But those familiar with the special counsel's work say Trump's conduct is being deeply investigated and that prosecutors are skeptical that Trump was just following advice. Just because an attorney gives you advice, an attorney does not provide uh, a defense if the attorney is suggesting you go out and violate a criminal law. That's not a defense. Um, there has to be a good faith belief that what you're doing is uh, legitimate. And Robert Costa joins me now, as well as CBS News congressional correspondent Scott McFarland. Bob, I'll start with you. What role does the president play in this indictment? Center stage or bit player? Center stage and the context of his role is really important because, as you remember, in the wake of the Capitol attack in 2021, Congress, congressional Democrats led an impeachment inquiry in the House, and it was about inciting a riot, inciting an insurrection, and it was about Trump's actions that day at the rally to push people towards the Capitol. What this indictment shows is that while that day of the Capitol attack was certainly an important chapter in this story. It's not the whole story. And the special counsel is alleging a widespread, months-long criminal conspiracy to overturn a presidential election under fraudulent means by saying the election was rigged and by saying that falsely and without evidence, putting into motion something that took American democracy to the brink. Scott, one of the charges is conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding, something dozens of January 6th rioters have already been convicted of. Tell us about that charge. You're, you're familiar with it from covering all those cases. The Justice Department has built quite a bit of muscle memory charging this unique charge of official procedure obstruction. The official proceeding, the official procedure was the counting of the electoral votes on January 6th, which was very much obstructed. There have been more than 310 defendants who were part of that riot, according to prosecutors, who faced that very charge. And the Department of Justice has secured a lot of guilty pleas, a lot of convictions, and a lot of prison time on that charge, a felony alone. But it speaks to something broader, John. We have casually here at the courthouse and in the nation referred to this special counsel as a January 6th investigator, somebody investigating January 6th. To a degree, that's right. But when Merrick Garland, the attorney general, appointed Jack Smith, he said it was an investigation of efforts to overturn the 2020 election, not just January 6th. And this indictment speaks to that. You see all these accusations of fake electors schemes, knowingly perpetuating false election claims, allegedly by the former president. There is this nugget in the case that references January 6th. But what they're saying in this indictment, John, is that Donald Trump allegedly took advantage, exploited, in their words, the violence of January 6th as an opening to call members of Congress and seek further delay of the proceedings, a further obstruction. That's where January 6th comes in in this 45-page indictment, kind of at the end, but as a tool used by the president, allegedly, to obstruct. A tool at the end of a long, uh, what the special counsel calls scheme. Bob, there are six unindicted Coast co-conspirators. Uh, co um, four are lawyers. What does that suggest to you? It suggests that Trump's 
upcoming defense that he was following the advice of counsel and operating within the bounds of the Constitution could be really under scrutiny by prosecutors in the coming months as this heads toward a trial. In essence, if a lawyer tells you to do something, it doesn't necessarily mean it's legal and perfect to just take their advice. If a lawyer tells you to go steal a car, it doesn't make it uh, so you're not going to be arrested if you steal the car. Right. Oh, the lawyer tell me, told me to do it. Well, you still have a responsibility as a citizen to, to live and operate and have your conduct within the bounds of the law. So Trump's defense here is not going to hold water in the eyes of the prosecutors. And so that's why they're moving forward in an aggressive way. And they're looking at Trump in this indictment as someone who's not just listening, but pushing pushing John Eastman to confront Mike Pence in the Oval Office and say, you have to do this. Listen to John. Listen to John, he said to Pence. And he's talking to Rudy Giuliani, pressuring Giuliani to go talk to Republicans in the states, not the other way around, to go to the Four Seasons in Philadelphia, not the hotel, but the landscaping facility, and to talk about how they're going to push Pennsylvania to overturn the election. So it's Trump's fingerprints. Do more. Say more. Get out there. His lawyers, in his view, based on our reporting, were soldiers, not just lawyers. Right. Shopping for lawyers who would tell him what he wanted to hear. Scott, finally to you, judges are so important in these cases. What do we know about the judge who's going to hear this case? It jumped right out of me as soon as I saw the case number, John. This case appears to be destined for Judge Tanya Chutkin, a 2014 appointee of former President Obama, who, while handling the January 6 riot cases, has been noticeably, distinctively vocal about the horrors of January 6th and the people who gave rise to it. She has been unbridled in her criticism, less muted than other federal judges in this courthouse. It's a noteworthy assignment. In the Florida federal criminal case, it's been assigned to a Trump appointee. There are Trump appointees in this courthouse, but this case didn't go to one. It goes to Judge Tanya Chodkin. But Thursday, when Trump appears here at 4 p.m. Eastern time for his appearance, it'll still be before the magistrate judge who accepted the indictment today, Judge Mokshila Opadiai. Then it heads to Judge Chotkin, likely in short order. Scott McFarland and Robert Costa, thank you both very much. The former president has been vocal about Tuesday's indictment on his social media site, Truth Social. Donald Trump called special prosecutor Jack Smith deranged, accusing him of trying to interfere in the 2024 election. Trump goes on to call the timing of this announcement prosecutorial misconduct before saying that the United States is a nation in decline. His campaign released a statement calling the investigation an un-American witch hunt. Special counsel Jack Smith said his office is seeking a speedy trial in the January 6th probe and that the investigation into other individuals is continuing. CBS News legal analyst Ricky Kleeman joins us now. Ricky, first, you know from indictments, when you look at this, what to you is the thing we need to keep our, what's the ball we need to keep our eye on? I think what we need to keep our eye on are what are the actual crimes being charged, not what is the whole political picture. This case, in and of its own nature, makes us enter a political discussion. But we're looking at here is the law, John, and the law is very painstaking when it sets out the elements of a crime and the elements of a criminal conspiracy. So here, what we know is there are a number of conspiracy counts. Two of them have literally been explored ad infinitum in wonderful detail by the January 6th committee. Remember, that was not a criminal charging body. So they refer these charges over to the special counsel. But he had to satisfy the members of a grand jury that what the special committee gave to him, put in another form, would create the elements of a crime. So one of the things that we see is that Donald Trump allegedly, we have to remember this is an allegation only, allegedly conspired with a number of other people. So one of the first questions we have is, who are those other people and why haven't they been indicted? Well, they may be indicted at a later point in time, or they may turn out to be witnesses against Donald Trump. So that's one of the things that's on my mind is, when are we going to know what these, uh, these other 
conspirators. What have they done? What are they doing in terms of going to trial? The special prosecutor asked for a speedy trial. What's your sense on the timing of this and how much of a role does the judge play in whether this is moved along expeditiously or not? The judge plays an enormous role. What you have here, John, we know already we have an indictment in the state of New York that's supposed to go to trial in March. We have an indictment from the Department of Justice that is lodged in Florida. That's supposed to go to trial in May. I would say that this case, because it involves the victims being democracy, the victims being the members of the American public, the victims being the voters whose votes might not have counted if, in fact, all of these schemes or any of these schemes of Donald Trump and his cohorts, as alleged, had come true, that voters would have been disenfranchised. The victims are the police officers and other people in the congressional buildings, people of Congress, people who work there, representatives, senators. So we have all of these victims. So it's the United States of America itself that's alleged to be a victim. So I say this case should go first. And the trial judge has the ability to be able to say, okay, I see you've got a March date in New York. I see you've got a May date in Florida. We're putting this case on in January or February, and those other cases will follow. Now, does that mean it will reach a trial in January or February? We don't know. But it certainly should be the one that goes first. And, John, I have to say why. Because it is important, because of the election in 2024, to know if Donald Trump is found guilty or not guilty of these crimes, including a crime of conspiracy to defraud the United States of America. Very quickly, Ricky, uh, if you were defending in this case, wouldn't you raise the fact that there's almost no place where Donald Trump received a smaller share of votes than Washington, D.C.? And getting an impartial jury, you could argue, would be very hard yes. just because of the politics. Yes, what do you of make course. of that? Um, I think, number one, you try to dismiss for prejudicial pretrial publicity. Number two, you look for a change of venue. Ultimately, we will see if you can find 12 people who can raise their hands and say that they can judge it on the facts that they hear in a courtroom. Ricky Kleeman, a pleasure as always. Thanks, Ricky. Thanks, John. Meanwhile, two allies of former President Trump were charged Tuesday in Michigan in connection with tampering with voting machines after the 2020 election. According to court records, former state attorney general Matthew DiPerno was charged with undue possession of a voting machine and conspiracy. And former Republican state representative Dare Rendon was charged with conspiracy to illegally possess voting machines. These charges stem from a special prosecutor's investigation into alleged conspiracy to breach voting machines. Coming up after the break, we'll discuss what kind of impact the latest criminal charges against the former president will have on his 2024 campaign, if they'll have any impact at all. You're streaming CBS News Primetime. If it's important to our nation. I wonder how you think about where America is at this moment. It's on Face the Nation. Can there be stability if Vladimir Putin remains in power? Face the Nation with Margaret Brennan on CBS. America decides, taking you inside American democracy. The most important stories on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. You're going to hear a lot of reporting. It is clearly a pivotal moment. Gun control, the economy, education. Both sides of the political aisle fight it out for power. Bringing you the analysis that you need. Thoughtfully, with context. Be part of the conversation. On CBS News Streaming. Welcome to America Decides. An original documentary from CBS reports. I always tell people that Twitter would not be Twitter without black Twitter. It's just us being in fellowship with each other. And it becomes a conversation you don't want to be left out of. People really started to recognize the power of activism on Twitter. Based on that one tweet, the hashtag Oscar so white was trending around the world. If anything has really powered black Twitter, it's been humor. If your food ain't right, Oh, we're going to tell you about that, too. Well, we tend to create 
change, create culture and cool. That's how movements happen on Black Twitter and go beyond more than that. Black Twitter, the Twitterverse that changed a generation. Now streaming on the free CBS News app. When weather turns extreme. The threat of severe weather and dangerous tornadoes is expected to last. CBS News and the Weather Channel bring you virtual weather technology. So advanced, so real. Let's bring in our partners at the Weather Channel. Now six feet of water, imagine that. Cars that can act like battery lamps. These hyper-realistic simulations show you what the weather will look and feel like before it happens. Feel the forecast. Streaming on CBS News. An original documentary from CBS Reports. The carnage in our nation's schools has become painfully repetitive. Not one more child! School shootings have parents fighting mad. I promised my daughter I was going to fight. It's going to keep on happening. And teachers taking lessons in how to fight back. This is an exercise. We approach it as it's you or them. It shouldn't have to be your teacher's job to protect your life. But will the battle over gun control... People are afraid that they're going to lose their gun rights altogether. ...be the hardest lesson of all. The exercise, you're having to shoot at an adult. Are you prepared to have to kill one of your students? Mm -hmm. Guns in the Classroom, now streaming on the free CBS News app. She's the most successful alpine skier, male or female, ever, and a worldwide inspiration. We need a lot of women doing sports really, really well. The story of Michaela Schifrin's game-changing reign at the top of the slopes when we go person to person. Donald Trump's campaign claimed on Tuesday the Justice Department is trying to interfere with the 2024 presidential election. Despite these claims, the former president's poll numbers remain strong in the first in the nation caucus state of Iowa. He was there last weekend at the GOP's annual Lincoln, Lincoln Day dinner, where he was warmly welcomed on stage as a Brooks and Dunn song played these lyrics. One could end up going to prison. One just might be president. For more on this, let's bring in Amanda Rooker. She is chief political reporter at our affiliate in Des Moines, Iowa, KCCI. So, Amanda, I know it's it's early hours, but what, if anything, are you hearing from Republicans in the state about this indictment? John, it may be because it's early or it may not be, but we're not hearing much from Republicans in Iowa on this right now. Mostly we're hearing silence. Uh, one that we have heard from, though, is Iowa Congresswoman Ashley Henson. She tweeted out another Biden scandal, another Trump indictment. Just like clockwork, we must stop this un-American politicization of the judicial system. That has been the reaction that we have heard from Iowa Republican leaders and voters on the ground in the Republican Party in Iowa as they hear these indictments. Some of them seem to be getting tired of it, um, and that may be why we're not hearing more responses. Um, their responses to the first indictment were loud. They were consistent. Uh, the second indictment, uh, they were a little bit quieter now, of course, uh, it's it's still early. It hasn't been that long since that indictment came down, but we're not hearing much from Republican leaders, much less Republican voters. Amanda, one of the things that uh, blessedly happens in in uh, primary contests is that there's a national message, and then Iowa, and then New Hampshire, and South Carolina, and other states get to weigh in, and the voters get to give their view, which is often at odds with the national view. But in this case. Is the former president as strong in Iowa as he appears to be nationally? There are a lot, number of national polls that show him basically running away with the race and none of his competitors very close. How would you characterize the situation there on the ground in Iowa? At the current moment, John, it seems to be the same in Iowa. A recent Fox Business poll from earlier in July showed that Donald Trump was polling at 46 percent. Uh, 30 points higher than 30 percentage points higher than Ron DeSantis, who was at 16 percent. Of course, that's a few weeks ago. It was before this new indictment. But it seems like Trump still has a major hold on on Iowans. And as you mentioned, he was campaigning. He was in Iowa on last Friday in Des Moines when he walked on stage. A crowd of more than a thousand Iowans gave him a standing ovation. There was a um, another one of his competitors, Will Hurd, who uh, told the crowd. Uh, Donald Trump is just running to stay out of prison and basically got booed off of stage. People were booing loudly. And so that seems to be the reason that 
Some of his other can uh, some of his other competitors are tiptoeing lightly around Trump. And the loud reaction of Iowa Republicans in that crowd seems to indicate, at least anecdotally, that Iowans here are still cheering on Trump despite the legal issues that are hanging over him. KCCI chief political reporter Amanda Rooker. Thanks so much, Amanda. Thank you. While the former president's third indictment takes center stage, the race for 2024 continues. A New York Times Siena College poll has Donald Trump with a 37 point lead over Florida Governor Ron DeSantis among the Republicans that were polled for that survey. For more on this, I am joined by CBS News political director Finn Gomez. Finn, it's great to be with you. Um, I mean, we talked about this just a little bit with Amanda, but uh, what what effect, if any, do you think this indictment will have on the president? And might it very well be to help him in his standing in the party? Uh, politically, yes. I mean, that's the trajectory that we, we are seeing. I was also in Iowa at the Lincoln Day dinner with Amanda. And and you saw that. You saw this uh, speaking to Iowa voters there, Iowa uh, caucus goers and, and some of the state leadership. They just, you know, to them, it, it's it's the... Uh, the these investigations are politically motivated. They buy into that line uh, that that um, thinking from Trump and his campaign that this is politically motivated, calculated by the Biden administration uh, and his support has only grown. If, if it, I, I spoke to an advisor to Trump just a little while ago and he predicted that uh, his his polling uh, numbers will only go up uh, among Republican voters. Uh, an ally of uh, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, Congressman Massey, said um, jokingly, but with some truth in it, um, what the governor needed to improve his chances was to get indicted. Um, you know, making the joke that 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 to your uh, point you just made, that that has been been helping the president. Is it also keeping the story away from any other candidate? In other words, to gain uh, stature in the polls, you need oxygen. Right. And these stories are taking all the oxygen out of the race. Oh, yeah, there there is no oxygen at this point. I mean, Nikki Haley, one of uh, Trump's rivals and his former U.N. ambassador when he was president, uh, has did say, said as much. DeSantis also this past week in New Hampshire said as much that, uh, you know, that this is essentially taking away all, you know, absorbing these investigations, the absorbing all the headlines, absorbing all the air and oxygen, as you said, and, and they and to talk about other issues or issues that are key to Republican voters is is almost uh, it's just not occurring. Is there any talk of? I mean, some people have written about this. Uh, Rich Lowry in the National Review, a number sure. of other columnists have, on the Republican side or on the conservative side have said. The Republican Party is more tightly wrapping its arms around a candidate who is not going to be able to win in the general election. Is that argument being used by anyone successfully? Is it even in the conversation? And if so, is anybody listening to that? It is. Actually, uh, Nikki Haley on, on Face the Nation earlier this week said uh, said that, you know, said essentially that um, that once and also again, Ron DeSantis, that you, you are hearing it more that once. If, if Donald Trump becomes a nominee again, and if he clears the primary and ends up as as the uh, as the nominee once again, he will be in the middle of these trials. It will be in the middle. Uh, it will be just right after the cr main crux of these early primary contests and, and Super Tuesday. And if he is the nominee, he's right in the middle of these trials. And what else? And, and the focus will be on that. And it's it's a much uh, the assumption is it's going to be a much different landscape when it gets to that point of the race if he becomes that. But if you see that the New York Times Siena poll, that same one, there were more of it came out today showing it was a head to head matchup with President Joe right. Biden. And, and they both have high negatives as well. Uh, and they have both have trouble with uh, independence, but it's head to head. It's, it's tied. Final question, Finn. Money. Lawyers cost and uh, former President Trump has been paying for some of it out of his political action committee. Is any of that a problem either legally or just is he going to have the cash that he needs to run for president 
while he's using some of it to defend himself. I think more more the latter. I mean, you think about it politically, uh, you need money for grassroots operations, for for canvassing, for for ads, all these things. And that is also, I mean, the the money, the millions, the tens of millions of dollars that's being spent in these legal costs, they aren't going to those uh, 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 crucial building blocks when it comes to a a, a presidential campaign. It's going to a legal to his legal fees, completely unprecedented. Finn Gomez, CBS News political director, thanks for being with us. Thanks, John. Amid the Trump indictment, there is another important story we're tracking. The credit rating of the United States has been downgraded from AAA to AA+. Fitch ratings cited increased debt at state and local levels, as well as the federal government's, quote, repeated debt limit standoffs and last-minute resolutions. Fitch says the possibility of a recession also played a role. Lower credit ratings may mean higher borrowing costs for the country in the future. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says she strongly disagrees with the decision, calling it arbitrary and based on outdated data. Coming up in just a few minutes, we take a closer look at the long list of other investigations swirling around the former president. You're streaming CBS News Primetime. An original documentary from CBS reports. Controversial Congressman George Santos. Why won't you answer our questions? How did he manage to get elected? Thank you very much. God bless you and God bless the USA. George Santos' campaign was a campaign of deceit, lies, and fabrication. And who is he, really? I knew him as Anthony DeVolder from Queens. Really, who he is, he's a fraud. I compare him to the Tinder swindler. From people who know him, the truth, the facts, the lies. He would say that he was worth a hundred million dollars. It's an incredibly cynical episode in American politics, beyond satire. Had you ever seen anything like this? No, and I hope I never see it again. Campaign of Deceit, now streaming on the free CBS News app. She dazzled on the court and off the court as a businesswoman. Thank you for joining us on Person to Person. Tennis superstar and entrepreneur, Serena Williams. An original CBS Reports documentary. I asked my students, what are we going to do about racism in the United States? The backlash over teaching about racism in American schools. I don't think it has any place in the classroom. We can either pretend and say, no, we're not racist and we're all great people, or we can actually start to do the really, really hard work of addressing it. How did you lose your job? I made the statement that white privilege is a fact. Is it helping diversity and inclusion? When you bring in different people's stories and experience, it enriches education. If you don't talk about something, it doesn't go away. Or driving us further apart. What schools are doing to our children in the name of anti-racism is in fact teaching them racism. The intention is to put us in this war against each other. An original CBS Reports documentary, streaming now. Original CBS Reports documentary. I was entitled to equal pay for equal work under the law. Does the Supreme Court's power need to be checked? Nine Supreme Court justices, five of them said no, she's not entitled. That's not right. Calls to fix the court tend to go along with the politics of the moment. Republican appointed justices have all tended to go in one direction, with the Democratic appointed justices tending to go in another. Even though it's only nine justices, it takes five of them to make the law of the land. Does it have political impact? True. Political intent? Probably not true. If the American people don't trust the judgment of their court, that's a real problem for our democracy. An original CBS Reports documentary, streaming now. On our places, bright, shiny faces. When you wake up in the morning, we want to be your go-to team. I don't go to work in the morning. I go for coffee with my two good friends, and we talk about the world.
Welcome back to CBS News Prime Time. Donald Trump is facing a third indictment. And to quickly refresh you on the state of things, the current GOP frontrunner is accused of trying to overturn the results of the 2020 presidential election. Tuesday, Tuesday's indictment charges him with four counts, including conspiracy and obstruction. Special Prosecutor Jack Smith was blunt after the indictment was unsealed. Since the attack on our capital, the Department of Justice has remained committed to ensuring accountability for those criminally responsible for what happened that day. Trump is also facing criminal charges in Manhattan connected to hush money payments made to adult film actress Stormy Daniels. He was also indicted on charges related to his handling of classified documents found at Mar-a-Lago. Trump could soon be indicted in Georgia over efforts to overturn the 2020 election as well. Here to talk about the panoply of other cases are CBS News congressional correspondent Nicole Killian, in get investigative reporter Graham Cates, and our chief national affairs and justice correspondent Jeff Begays. Nicole, we're going to start with you. What's the latest out of the Georgia investigation? Well, relative to what we saw happen earlier today in Washington, D.C., things have been relatively quiet here in Fulton County. But make no mistakes, the process is very much underway here as District Attorney Fani Willis moves closer to a potential charging decision to grand juries were seated last month. We do know that one of those grand juries did meet here at the courthouse today and also met yesterday. And really, we are bracing for the possibility of some type of decision to be issued within either a matter of days or a matter of weeks, certainly sometime before the end of the month. In fact, the district attorney has made clear that she is ready to go with respect to this two and a half year investigation that she and her office have been conducting. We did hear from the Fulton County Sheriff a bit earlier today because there are a lot of uh, security measures that have been stepped up in preparation for a potential decision, including barricades that have been set up outside of the courthouse. But the sheriff, too, reiterated uh, that his department is ready and that if an indictment were to come down today, they, too, are in a position where they're ready to go. Nicole, would Mike Tuesday's indictment affect the Georgia case? You know, it's unlikely that it would have any direct impact other than timing uh, if there was an indictment here and it impacts uh, the scheduling of uh, future trials. But uh, what I will say and what you very well know is there is quite a lot of overlap between these two cases. You know, reading through a Tuesday's indictment, there are several pages about what happened here in Georgia, including some of the calls that were made to Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger and reading directly from that indictment, it says the defendant lied to the Georgia Secretary of State to induce him to alter Georgia's popular vote count and call into question the validity of the Biden electors' votes. And it goes on to cite, and of course, the defendant being the former president, uh, these allegations uh, that he raised about potential dead people voting, which the Secretary of State disputed, and also that infamous call where the former president pressed the Secretary of State to find him the 11,760 votes. So we do know that, of course, Brad Raffensperger spoke with federal prosecutors. He also appeared before a special grand purpose jury here in Fulton County uh, some time ago. And so uh, it is likely uh, that uh, from that standpoint, you know, we will see uh, similar uh, readouts with respect to a perspective indictment here simply because the district attorney is looking into similar facts, including uh, that call that the secretary of state made. I would also very briefly note that in listening to the Fulton County Sheriff uh, earlier today, he did talk about uh, in terms of preparations that they are making that it's possible he could send a team to Washington when the former president makes his court appearance. That is something that the Fulton County Sheriff's Office did in the case of the indictment uh, where we saw the former president appear in Miami in the classified documents case. Also in New York, he sent a team and he said that his department has learned lessons about the importance of setting up a security perimeter. So it's very possible from a security preparation standpoint uh, that this indictment today could impact uh, how the Fulton County Sheriff's Office and potentially the district attorney moves forward. 
Nicole Killian, thank you so much uh, from down there in Atlanta. Graham, let's go to you next. Uh, we're talking now about the Manhattan District Attorney's investigation of the former President Trump. Give us an update on where that stands right now. Sure, the trial of that case is scheduled for March 2024. That's in the heat of the primary season, and it's expected to last a couple of weeks. But these early months of the pretrial process have largely been marked by Trump's attempts to get the current judge off of the case. He asked that judge, uh, New York Judge Juan Marchand, to recuse himself and separately asked a federal judge to move the case from state court to federal court. Last month, the, that effort was rejected. The federal judge said, no, this case belongs in New York court. And he said that the, a lot of the arguments that Trump had put forward weren't with merit. And an interesting thing that happened around that same time in July was that that New York judge actually ruled in Trump's favor in a couple of matters. He quashed subpoenas related to uh, emails between uh, Melania Trump and a couple of Trump Organization staffers, and also subpoenas seeking a wide range of emails from the Trump Organization to White House personnel. Graham, the case in Manhattan is of the three cases, criminal cases in which the president has been indicted. It is widely viewed by analysts and lawyers to be the weakest of the three. Is that, or it was, you know, when originally when it was brought, does that still hold? Is there an emerging view that's different from that in terms of those who've watched this case as it goes forward and as it heads to trial? You know, I can't speak to what case is weaker or stronger than any other one, but an interesting thing from the federal judge's ruling was that he actually kind of point by point knocked it back against a lot of the uh, arguments that Trump has, Trump and his team have been making both in court and in public against that case. Um, one of the things is about whether uh, these can be charged as felony at, felonies at all. This is uh, 34 state felony charges of falsification of business records. And um, there have been some questions about whether that's an appropriate charge. And the federal judge said uh, essentially that th there wasn't a good argument against that, um, at least that he heard during the one hearing that he oversaw and, and the uh, filings that he reviewed. And, you know, I know from sources at the Manhattan District Attorney's Office that they were really surprised by the length that that federal judge went in, in kind of defending them, and they saw that as a major victory that they could potentially carry forward um, into the trial. Jeff Pegues, I now want to switch to you. What's the latest on the Mar-a-Lago uh, classified documents case? There is a new defendant in that case. He appeared in court earlier this week on Monday. He didn't enter a plea. His name is Carlos de Oliveira. He is the property manager, or was, has been there for about 20 years, and now prosecutors have accused him, along with uh, Walt Nada and Mr. Trump, of trying to move and obstruct and uh, delete some of the evidence in this case. So this case also has many serious charges already, uh, on top of the fact that the former president had these classified documents in his possession. Uh, that he should not have had at that time. Uh, and, John, we're actually coming up on the anniversary of this Mar-a-Lago search. It's my how time flies and my ha how the world has changed in all of these cases. But this is another complicated case. You know, a lot of people think that perhaps of all the cases the former president is facing, this may be the most cut and dry. But there are so many issues in this case about classification mm -hmm. and who has the clearances to see these documents. It makes it a little bit more complicated in terms of a timeline for how this case progresses. Jeff Begays, thank you, along with Graham Cates and Nicole Killian. Coming up, we'll have reactions from lawmakers whose workplace is at the center of the latest indictment. You're streaming CBS News Primetime. It's a history-making meeting. Four extraordinary women who are all four-star generals and admirals. How did you deal with being discriminated against? I just worked harder. The future of an ever-evolving U.S. military when we go person to person.
Stories start with the who, what, when, and where. CBS News has been following this story. Camilla, why is the government relying on these devices to track migrants? But it's why it's important to you that matters most. Doctor, why are federal health advisors focusing on this specific pill for contraception? And knowing what to ask is how you open the door to a deeper understanding. I'm John Dickerson. See you on Primetime. Streaming free everywhere. Stories that inform. Or you can be really old at 60, and you can be really young at 85. Inspire. How do we unlock the power within ourselves to be who we want to be? And brighten your day. The best part of fame is making people feel good. Always send the people home happy. Make every day a little more like Sunday morning. Here comes the sun. Stream now on the free CBS News app. An original documentary from CBS Reports. He started out as a fun-loving party boy, but the alcohol got the better of him. What I envisioned was him being in some sort of medical facility. I just thought, what a great candidate for them to learn about the results of alcoholism and what it does to a body. But his body was sold to the military, specifically used as a crash test dummy in the simulated Humvee explosion. I was devastated. I had the box. I don't know if they were his ashes or not. I just held it as tight as I could, and I just told him how sorry I was. Body Brokers, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Hey there, welcome to The Uplift. I look over at him, and he's smiling. I'm going to remember that the rest of my life. It's really a miracle that he's with us today. The Uplift, stream now on the free CBS News app. America decides, taking you inside American democracy. The most important stories on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. You're going to hear a lot of reporting. It is clearly a pivotal moment. Gun control, the economy, education. Both sides of the political aisle fight it out for power. Bring you the analysis that you need. Thoughtfully, with context. Be part of the conversation. On CBS News Streaming. Welcome to America Decides, Monday through Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern. After nearly four decades of March Madness, this sports broadcasting legend is stepping away from his role in covering the NCAA basketball tournament. Jim Nance on his fondest memories and what's next when we go person to person. Members of Congress are reacting to this latest indictment of former President Trump and CBS News correspondent Skylar Henry joins us now to talk about this. Skylar, how are Republicans first responding to this latest indictment? Hey, John, good to be with you. Well, as you can imagine, Trump allies certainly coming out in full force in support of the former president. We've seen several tweets, including from congressional leadership, pointing out what they feel as if is a double standard in terms of the investigations into the former president. Some have even called for the defunding of the special counsel's office, Jack Smith in this case, altogether while also saying that this is merely a distraction from the other federal investigation into President Biden's son, Hunter. Now, something that we've heard over the past few weeks and months, especially a phrase impeachment inquiry. We know that House Republicans certainly are looking to see if there is any tie to the former president's son and his business dealings uh, with President Biden. We know that one of Hunter Biden's former business associates, Devin Archer, was here on Capitol Hill testifying behind closed doors for hours in front of the House Oversight Committee talking about what could possibly link the former president or excuse me, the president to his son. But we know that Republicans certainly have been critical of that, even going so far as saying that it is an abuse of power by the Justice Department. And now, Skylar, what are we hearing from the Democrats? Yeah, you bet. Uh, so. I think all along, uh, Democrats have certainly been critical of the former president, not only with this indictment, but the others uh, that are against the uh, former president. We've heard from Democratic leadership 
who has talked about what this indictment means, saying that it's pointing to the most serious and consequential in terms of this indictment, also going so far as to say that no one, including the president of the United States, is above the law. But, John, I also want to point out a couple of other perspectives here. We've heard from some of the officers, especially those who were here that day on January 6th, notably Officer Harry Dunn, who put out on Twitter, uh, ultimately saying that this indictment only serves as a mile marker along the highway to justice and accountability. Also, credit to our congressional correspondent, Nicole Killian, who received a text from the wife of fallen Capitol Police Officer Brian Sicknick, who ultimately said that she can now hope that justice will be served. He needs to be held accountable for everything he's done. We've also heard from candidates along the campaign trail vying to be the Republican nominee for the president of the United States, former uh, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, Nikki Haley, the former ambassador, have all come out to say that these indictments are distractions. But recently, just in the last 30 minutes or so, we heard from former Vice President Mike Pence, who we all know was inside the Capitol that day on January 6th, who said that today's indictment serves as an important reminder. Anyone who puts himself over the Constitution should never be president of the United States. Now, we should point out that as part of that indictment that we saw today, uh, that it said that the former vice president didn't want to go along with that January 6th plan carried out by the former president and other co-conspirators. And so I think that is absolutely some of the most compelling remarks that we've heard throughout the day today. The former vice president going out so far as to say something like this in the hours following this indictment. John. Skylar Henry, thank you so much for being with us. You bet. As former President Trump continues to push back against his various indictments, President Biden is still not engaging when it comes to his predecessor's problems. CBS News Chief White House Correspondent Nancy Cordes joins me now from Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. So, Nancy, um, th there was never any notion that the president was going to respond um, and that's pretty much going to be the case. Uh, but he has talked about this, the behavior of his predecessor before. Right. And not only is he not responding here, but he's out at the movies right now. Uh, John, he's seeing the blockbuster Oppenheimer uh, here on his vacation. We did put uh, the question to both the White House and to the Biden campaign. What do they think about this indictment. Do they have any response at all? Uh, the Biden campaign very quickly declined to comment. And uh, a White House official, and I want to read this to you because I thought it was notable, uh, simply said to me that, um, that they are not going to have any comment because uh, they want to refer us to the Justice Department, which conducts its criminal investigations independently, making the point that they have nothing to do with this. They know uh, that no matter what they say, that the former president and his allies and other Republicans are going to come out and say that this is publicly motivated, that the White House is trying to put its thumb on the scale in an election year, whether there is any evidence of that or not. And so they certainly don't want to do anything to fuel that fire. They don't want to be seen uh, to be uh, putting a thumb on the scale. Nevertheless, President Biden, as you noted, has uh, had a lot to say about this situation, uh, the pre former president's actions uh, on January 6th in the past. And he basically accused former President Trump of flan fanning the flames, inciting this insurrection, and then doing nothing to quell it in the hours that it was taking place. Uh, he has been uh, uh, you know, savage in his uh, analysis of President Trump's actions that day. And um, now we'll see if the accusations that he has made end up holding water in a court of law. Nancy Cordes, Chief White House Correspondent, traveling with President Biden. Thanks, Nancy. Coming up, the hurdles prosecutors will have to clear to win their case against the former president. We break down where the case and the country stand two and a half years. After the assault on the Capitol, you're streaming CBS News primetime.
people from every corner of America facing challenges. Everyone is just looking for some type of connection. Just raise your hand and say, hey, I'd like to help. Coming together to find solutions. We are going to do something about it. Their stories are our stories. Welcome to Eye on America. Stream now on the free CBS News app. At the CBS Evening News, we focus on solutions. We look at a story and we say, how do we make it relevant to people's lives? So this is what we eat to live longer. Finding solutions to help people understand what are the right choices to make for you and your family. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Morning news matters because it sets the tone for your day, and it's a way of getting you started. We take you places, teach you new things, and we make you feel like, you know, it's not all bad. We're going to uplift you. People say to me, you always seem to be having a good time. I mean, you know what? You're right. Your morning routine just got better. CBS Mornings. An original documentary from CBS Reports. You had a substitute teacher that was pretty popular. What was his reputation? Everyone loved him. You had to miss a test. What did he offer to have you make up the test? He said that I can come by after school was all over and just take the exam. The blinds were down. He closed the door. The next thing I knew, he was right next to me. That's when I realized what was going to happen. Even if I wanted to scream at the top of my lungs, no one would hear me because no one was there. He told me that if I ever said anything to anyone, he would kill me and he would kill my family. So I did it. Pledge of Silence, now streaming on the free CBS News app. She was near the finish line of the Boston Marathon when a terrorist bomb changed everything. Join us for an extraordinary story of survival, persistence, and triumph when we go person to person. When weather is about to get extreme. We're talking about hail. We're talking about tornadoes, damaging wind. Every second counts. Let's now take a look at what that really means to you. That's why CBS News and the Weather Channel have come together to bring you virtual weather technology. So advanced, so real. We can show you what it's going to look like when the storms come through. You'll see what will happen, where it will happen, before it does. Feel the forecast on CBS News. Time to get prepared. We're really excited that we've been honored with the Emmy Award for Outstanding Live News Program. But we know we couldn't have done that without you. So thank you. CBS Mornings, weekdays at 7 on CBS. We go to stories because we can bring someone to that story. That human connection is incredibly important. The news doesn't have to be depressing. What do you love about running? Energy! Energy! It can be uplifting. Prosecutors on Tuesday laid out their case against former President Trump in, in a 45-page indictment filled with details from his closest associates. But that's different than winning the case in court. And to talk about some of the hurdles that prosecutors will need to clear, CBS News legal contributor Jessica Levinson joins me now. Jessica, um, when you look at the indictment, and we'll already stipulate that, that it's still pretty fresh, um, in the world. But when you look at the indictment, what do you think some of the challenges are for prosecutors in terms of trying to actually get convictions on these charges? Well, as you said, there is a big difference between an indictment and a conviction. There's a different standard. Um, but I think the challenge will always be proving that these are intentional crimes, proving that the former president, in fact, did create that corrupt intent that you need. And that's why I think you see special counsel Jack Smith start this indictment with the fact that the former president allegedly spread lies and then spend so much time in the indictment talking about the idea that the former president knew exactly what he was doing. We were hearing some indication that perhaps Trump was going to say, look, I was just following the advice of counsel. I talked to lawyers and they said that I could go ahead. And I think that's potentially one of the bigger thresholds for the prosecution. And that's why you see them spend so much time on that in the indictment. In a general sense, let's leave this aside from the former president's actions at the moment, but in a general sense, um, how 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 effective is that kind of an argument in a case? Um, I mean, if I rob a bank, I can't say, well, the guard said it was OK to rob the bank. Right. I mean, at some point, credulity gets strained. What's the normal test in the law for that kind of a defense? 
Well, the normal test is always going to be what does the jury believe? And part of this case and part of every case will obviously be looking at defendants and if they take the stand, watching them and thinking, do they have credibility? Do I believe that? Now, John, I will just say everybody knows that it's wrong to rob a bank. But I think what the defense might hope is that, you know, election laws are really complicated. And so the former president, not being an election lawyer, talked to attorneys and he was told this was okay. Robbing the bank, we're not going to believe he thought that was okay. Is this a good argument? No. Is it potentially a passable argument? I don't think so, but I think that's where we'll see him spend some time. And then finally, quickly, Jessica, one of the focuses of this indictment is the vice former vice president, Mike Pence, who was with the former president at these tense moments in which uh, President Trump is trying to convince him to uh, to overthrow the vote, essentially, on January 6th. Is is the vice president so crucial to this case because he can testify essentially as much as you can get into anyone's head into what the former president was thinking at that crucial time? I, I think that is exactly right. And this indictment really lays out for me between lies and actions taken to try and execute those lies. And I see Vice President Pence really at the center of that, of the former president propagating these alleged lies and then saying to Vice President Pence, and now go forward and execute my plan for me. Mm -hmm. Vice President Pence didn't have the constitutional authority. He said he didn't. And I think mm -hmm. while the case doesn't collapse without him, I do think he's key. Jessica Levinson, thanks so much, as always, for being with us. Up next, our continuing coverage of the latest indictment of former President Donald Trump. For all of us here at CBS News Prime Time, I'm John Dickerson. That's our report. Thank you for spending the hour with us. It's important to our nation. I wonder how you think about where America is at this moment. It's on Face the Nation. Can there be stability if Vladimir Putin remains in power? Face the Nation with Margaret Brennan on CBS. An original documentary from CBS reports. AI is among the most world-changing technologies ever. Curing diseases, scientific breakthroughs, making lives better. They can help us with medical discovery, scientific discoveries, doing better agriculture, having cures for things like Alzheimer's. It's also going to really transform.